Uh, welcome to this, the second meeting of 2013 of the European External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request to switch off any electronic equipment as they interfere with broadcasting equipment? And we'll move straight into our first agenda item this morning, which is a consideration of the latest edition of the Brussels Bulletin, which is compiled regularly by our European officer, Dr Ian Duncan. And I think, we'll, Ian, if you can take some time to talk us through the Brussels Bulletin, please. Absolutely. Um, there are a few things in the bulletin. I'm, I'm going to start in reverse order, if you like, just with the, uh, the fisheries negotiations. Now, you'll remember, of course, that um, see, the bulletin doesn't normally get this level of attention, I hasten to add. But um, on the fisheries item, Hansala, you were raising this uh, last week, the week before, about the issue of mackerel. Now, what has happened is that the science for mackerel, the Norwegians and the EU have now agreed their if you like, total allowable catch for mackerel in accordance with the science. However, that accounts for 95% of the catch. The other 5% is to be shared between Iceland and the Faroe Isles. But of course, Iceland and the Faroe Isles are not catching 5% of the total allowable catch. They're catching, on last year's evidence alone, uh, over 30%. So this is not really a great success at all, in fact. And you all recall again, Hansala, that you raised the issue of why has there been no action at an EU level? And that remains a question. There has been no action at that point. Um, the next stage will then be to try and broker some sort of deal between Iceland, the Faroe Isles, and the EU and Norway. That doesn't look like progress we made at all. So I suspect the only way forward will be to look at some other measures. We'll have to wait and see what comes out in the next couple of weeks. A couple of other things in here which are perhaps worth noting. One, the uh, Commission has published uh, an action plan for entrepreneurship, which is probably quite a helpful thing. And I draw your attention again to the, what they're terming the importance of facilitating access to microfinance or financial instruments, which again will bring us back into the Jessica and Jeremy territory, which will be important um, at a particular level. On the issue of funding, I'm also wanting to draw your attention to one of the um, audits, the Energy Efficiency Audit, which was done by the European Court of Auditors. It's worthwhile noting there that they've audited, if you like, the main recipients uh, of the spend of cohesion funds, and they're not very complimentary at all. They're basically all but saying wrongdoing has happened. And it's worthwhile being aware of that, that lots of money is spent, but sometimes, of course, the actual um, trace of that money and what it achieves is... Uh, is not easily uh, defended. Also on energy, there's a consultation on energy technology, which is perhaps worth drawing to the attention of the um, Economy and Energy Committee. And uh, finally, I wanted to raise something else, which is... Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, one of the other issues, again, we've got more money going into energy. The European Investment Bank is injecting a further £10 billion into clean energy, which I think is something worth noting. Um, again, Willie Coffee for you. The credit rating agency's issue is once again back in the Parliament. They are very keen to bring in some sort of registration and regulation of these uh, particular bodies. And the final thing, to, yesterday and today, the um, Agricultural Committee of the European Parliament began its discussion over the reform of the CAP. Now, there are over a thousand amendments being discussed at present. Uh, they met yesterday, they are meeting today. It's worth noting that no one now believes that agreement will be reached in time for this to be incorporated into the 2014 launch date. They are now expecting this to be delayed by one year, 2015. That would mean a continuation of the current arrangements for an additional year. Now, that might be good news for some people in the West, but of course it's very bad news for the farmers in the East. So that's what they're expecting. It's not a certainty, but it's worth being aware of that. So again, I'm happy to take questions on, on these or on any other issues. Okay, questions, Zala. Um, Two questions. Um, oh, that's first the, thing, uh, on the mackerel issue, Ian, um, I understand from what I've heard that the it, it has been said that Iceland and the Faroes are actually breaking the law. Could you explain how they are breaking the law? Or what, what law are they breaking? Well, this is one of these um, more difficult questions to answer. They would argue that they're not breaking the law. What they are arguing is that because this is a biological stock which is changing and is now in their own waters, it's, if you like, the, the, the common sense approach, they would argue, which is to um, catch the fish in their own waters. So the, the laws which you would seek to invoke then would be, if you like, global laws or laws of uh, original agreement. 
Now, in the past, there has been an agreement between Iceland and the Faroes, the EU and Norway, about how the stock would be divided up. And that's where this proportion of 5% to Iceland and Norway comes from. That's why Iceland and the Faroes, and then 95% for the rest. But that was at a time when, frankly, the macro were just not in the waters of those nations. So they were indifferent, broadly, to that particular issue. What they're now finding is that the macro are primarily in their waters, an abundance of mackerel in their waters. And they are resentful, therefore, that they are now being excluded from catching fish, which is, you know, they could literally throw a net from the, the beach almost and drag them ashore. So, that, so in that sense, they're no longer feeling bound to, uh, to an agreement, not a law, but an agreement which is no longer, as they would argue, tenable. I, I just want to clarify, it was an agreement and not an actual law that they're breaching. And the second question, uh, when you say that um, the delay in the negotiations on, on, on the uh, amendments to the CAP uh, may be delayed for, for a year, um, and you said that may be good for the West, but, but, but very bad for, pe for people in the East. What do you mean by, by that r remark? Well, um, you might recall that when the member states joined in the East, an agreement was reached, a slightly self-serving agreement for the West, which said that it would take some time for the Eastern European member states to fully understand what they could do with the money. So there was no point in giving them what, in a sense, would be their share too soon. Rather, they would keep the current arrangements and there would be a slight adjustment for the East. So at the moment, a number of member states in the East are receiving considerably less than would be their share under the current agreement. Now, in order for the East to get more money, somebody has to get less money. And the, the expectation would be that those farmers in the West would get proportionally less money as those in the East got more. So if you delay it for a year, you're delaying the slightly iniquitous balance of payments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Panzala. Uh, thank you, Chair. First of all, I think, Chair, perhaps we as a committee should write a letter to the, the new president, congratulating him in his new post and wishing him well in it. Uh, I think that, that that would be a good thing to do for us. And the second thing uh, I'm still concerned about the fish fish situation and I really think that we need to do we need to make some serious approaches to the European Union in terms of to get to grips with it and somehow um, I'm not sure what would be the best route to take however one of the things that does come to mind is perhaps a ban of imports from Iceland and Faroes um, of all their stock till such times as we can come to a conclusion this might focus them a little, but then again, uh, because I don't know the full picture, I'm not sure if this is the only option that we have open to us. There may be others. What I would not wish to do is to harm their industry, but at the same time, we can't allow them to harm our industry. So they need to be fair about this, uh, and uh, therefore action needs to be taken. And I think we as a, a committee need to write to, to bring to the attention of the EC that we, are, we have serious concerns about this issue and we would rather that they took affirmative action at the earliest because unfortunately these things tend to take a very long time to resolve and while they're taking their time to resolve this we're losing the fish um, and that needs, to, that needs to come to a halt. Yes, I can, <clears throat> I can pick up on that. One of the consequences of this particular situation is that you might recall that five or six years ago, the Marine Conservation Society accredited the mackerel fishery of uh, the waters around uh, the northwest and northeast of Europe as sustainably fished. And you may have seen report in the news this week that um, the advice from them is now stop eating as much mackerel because it <laughs> isn't now being sustainably fished. The, the frustration in all of that is that, if you like, 95% of the agreement is still being adhered to. It's the 5% now, which is no longer being adhered to. So you're finding that the EU and Norway are doing what they are meant to be doing within the, 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 the rules and the guidance from the scientists. However, um, Norway, uh, sorry, Iceland and um, Iceland affairs are not doing that, and that's causing a serious problem. The difficulty and the reason why there is no ban uh, on imports or, or, uh, is because the support is not as widespread as you would imagine. And it's, the UK itself has been less than... Um, excited by the prospect because the principal mackerel processing is in the UK. And so a lot of jobs, um, both in the northeast of Scotland, up in Shetland and down 
uh, in the north of England depend upon the mackerel for processing. So the, the, it then becomes a much more complicated balance. Now, you're absolutely right, something must be done. There's no question of that. And it might be worthwhile us um, almost asking the question, what now are both the Scottish and UK governments intending to do to establish uh, a more balanced and sustainable fishery as a first step, as an urgent first step? And once we have that information, then uh, trying to take forward as best we can, probably in collaboration with the uh, Rural Affairs and the Climate Change and Environment Committee of the Scottish Parliament to make sure that we're all uh, linking arms. But yes, I think that might be a, a first step. Okay. Yeah. Really coffee. Thanks, Convener. Just to follow in that discussion there, I think that would be a wise move for us to do, to, to seek advice from our own government in Scotland and the United Kingdom about what the approach they may wish to take. And I think ultimately we, we need to have a negotiated settlement yeah. with our, our friends in the north, and I think ultimately that's, that's what will happen. Uh, I wanted to pick up uh, on other aspects of the Brussels Bulletin, Convener, uh, and my attention is drawn to the Irish presidency of the European Council and one of the Irish um, commitments is to support enlargement of the Union. Now, it's probably coming at an interesting time given the, the events of yesterday where we could potentially be facing shrinkage of the European Union if Mr Cameron gets his way and recommends withdrawal of Scotland from the, the European Union, perhaps against it, its will at that particular point. So it's a very interesting discussion we're going to have over the next few years particularly over Scotland's position within the United Kingdom and therefore the United Kingdom's position within the European Union. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested, of course, in, in a little paragraph that's at the foot of your report, Ian, and that relates to uh, accession of states like Serbia and Kosovo. And I'm sure I don't need to remind Irish colleagues or any other colleagues about the delicacy of that uh, um, Serbia, as many, many members will know, don't, doesn't currently recognise the independence of Kosovo and that is bound to introduce some difficulties in negotiations to bring Serbia into the European Union. Uh, so I'm j I would just like to put that on the record that at least we, we here in the Scottish Parliament do have and have had useful and working relationships with Serbia, Kosovo, Macedonia and so on. And I think we would be supportive of a, of a, of a fair and a simplified transition process for all of these states to, to join the European Union. And hopefully Scotland will remain one of those nations too within that family of nations. Yes, <clears throat> it's worthwhile noting that the, um, the next state likely to join the <coughs> Union is, is likely to be Croatia, which I think will join just after the end of the Irish uh, presidency. With regards to the negotiations, you're quite right, Serbia and Kosovo remains a thorny issue. The Irish have adopted a different strategy. Rather than trying to tackle the, the big issue first, they're trying to tackle other issues as a way of hopefully creating goodwill to then allow the more thorny issues to find a solution. So they're hoping to make progress with that. Um, the bigger test, I suspect, will be Turkey, which, as you know, is the, the longest-serving accession state. Uh, it has now been since... 1999, it's a long time. Um, progress has been more or less stuck because of various member states halting the, what they call the chapters. They close chapters and that means nothing can be done with them. The Irish are hopeful that something can be done to start opening up the chapters and make some progress toward accession. I mean, as, as you will recall, that since 1999, a number of other member states have joined. Um, and even Iceland, which might not be quite as keen to join now as once it was, is still considered to be more likely to join than Turkey, despite the fact that it only put in its application um, 18 months ago, two years ago. So, but no, I, I, I know what you're okay. yeah. Rod Campbell. Uh, the question I wanted to ask was precisely in relation to Iceland's negotiations uh, to join. I'm going to say, I think they stalled, one of the reasons they stalled is for a domestic election in Iceland, but there are four chapters outstanding, including fishing. So I don't know how, whether that ties in with the kind of the mackerel dispute. But uh, are you aware of any kind of plan uh, um, to, as to how to move the Icelandic question on, for want of a better word? Mm. <coughs> I suspect the, it's the Ice, Icelandic people who are now no longer quite as uh, vociferous in their push. That's what actually seems to be holding it up. The, the president has always been lukewarm and has suggested that a, a referendum might still be required in order to go forward on this. The fisheries chapter will remain the most 
problematic of all, particularly now with the, the, the Merkel issue remaining unresolved. And I suspect until resolution is achieved on that issue, it would be all but impossible to make progress uh, on the fisheries chapter. And, and that, that is the biggest one, because the industry in Iceland now that the banks are no longer quite what they were is fishing. Uh, if, is it your view that uh, if the Icelandic people uh, suddenly became a bit more uh, enthusiastic about joining that Iceland could possibly join quite quickly? Yes, I Iceland would be broadly compliant with all the necessary laws. They are, um, as far as I'm aware, there are some smaller issues which need to be addressed. The, the fishing chapter is, is the thorniest of all because because you can do it different ways. I think that there isn't a... I suspect they would seek to have various opt-outs from the common fisheries policy. And I suspect various member states, no doubt, uh, the UK and Scotland would not be as supportive of these opt-outs for various reasons. Um, I think if that could be addressed, if the opt-outs or adjustments could be made, then I suspect that chapter could be closed relatively quickly. But I suspect in order for that to be the case, they would have to address the mackerel issue. And I'm, I'm yet to see how they can do that without um, their fishermen um, accepting that. And at the moment, the fishermen are, are determined that the, f the stock is being fished entirely sustainably uh, against all scientific evidence. An opt-out from the common fisheries policy might be of interest to a hypothetical independent Scotland in negotiations after a referendum. Of interest to lots of member states with fish, I would imagine. Yes. Okay, quickly, Jimmy, yeah? yeah. I just wanted to pursue what um, Gonzalez said about sanctions being the answer. Am I right in thinking that the problem is not just with the mackerel, but with the white fish that are also landed in this country from Iceland, which our processes depend on? and that any sanction on those would be fairly uh, undesirable for our processing sector. And the second question is, um, I understand that the total allowable catch, or, or the suggested TAC for macro is some 600,000 tonnes. And if Iceland is now catching, or, and the Faroes are now catching 30% more when their, their allocation is only 5% of that total, surely the answer lies in redistributing the 25% extra which is being caught between all the catchers, uh, which, you know, in that case, they might not have to take such a big hit. Um, and and, and the, the, the problem might be able to be resolved in that way. Do you have yes. a comment on that? <clears throat> Let me do that. Um, commenting on the whitefish issue first, yes, um, you'll be aware that most of the, the cod eaten in the UK now is broadly caught in Icelandic waters. Uh, and, um, and much of it then, again, of course, is uh, processed, uh, landed and processed. Uh, from discussions before Christmas uh, with uh, DG Mary in Brussels, they were of the view that they could still create um, a restriction that would focus primarily upon a single species, the mackerel, rather than trying to expand it beyond. But clearly, if you wish to be punitive, then you could expand it beyond with the concomitant effect upon the processes in the UK. So that, that remains the sticking block for the UK. In terms, then, of the redistribution, this is one of these devilish questions because the total allowable catch is broadly what scientists believe can be taken from the sea, still leaving enough fish to breed and create the next generation of, of, of fish. So the total allowable catch is, is based upon the science. The allocation of the total allowable catch is based upon an allocation key. And you'll be aware, for example, that in the North Sea, that was set quite some time ago, and it's literally a formula. So once you've got the total allowable catch, you plug in the formula, and you know exactly what the UK gets, and indeed what Scotland gets. Uh, you know what all the other member states get. If you were to accept that the 600,000 tonnes was a wrong figure, and indeed should be 30% higher, if you applied the distribution key, the EU and Norway would still get 95% of it. And the problem is that, yes, the pharaohs and Iceland would get a wee bit more, but not what they're currently harvesting. So their, their argument is that there should be a, a, a redrafting of the allocation key itself, because at, at the moment the, the, the EU position has been they can make some small adjustments. But the Icelandic view is that small adjustments are inadequate to represent what they see as a fundamental change in the stock. So your notion is a sensible one in one regard, but one unlikely to find support in Norway or the Faroe Islands. Okay. Um. 
Ian, can I just ask you uh, about uh, something that's in the Brussels bu Bulletin on aspartame, which is uh, the sweetener, and I see that it's been reviewed uh, many, many times, five times since it was uh, authorised in 1994, and it's up for review again, and there's grave concerns about the impact it has on, on health. I just wonder if you maybe give us a wee update on you know, the continuous reviewing of this and uh, what, what that means. Uh, and the other thing that I would uh, wish uh, f to look at, it's not in the Brussels Bulletin, but hopefully uh, maybe the next Brussels Bulletin you could bring something back to us, is that the William Hague uh, has produced a document called Fresh Start in Europe, which is the UK government's uh, proposed position on renegotiation. And there's been many conversations about what that means. Um, but what I'm specifically looking at is if there's a withdrawal from what's called the social charter, the impact and the consequences of that, working time directive, workers' rights, the right to equal pay and gender balance situations. There's a number of things there that give me grave concern that if we withdraw from the social charter, then the impact that will have um, on, on our people. Um, I don't know whether you've got any comment on that or you can bring something back to the, the next Brussels bulletin. I would suggest I bring something back. That is, um, as you might remember, when uh, the UK signed up to it, it was a big step at that time. And there's no doubt now that um, withdrawal from any of the particular areas will have a huge impact. Uh, what I suggest then is that in collaboration with SPICE, we, we put together a short note on um, the social chapter of what it means at the moment and um, the consequences that might result from um, adjustment to that particular thing. That might take a little bit longer than the next meeting but it will be brought back as quickly as we can make it so. In terms of the, um, the NutraSweet one, I, I put this in the, in the bullet because it struck me as an interesting one, because again, NutraSweet is such an, almost a, an endemic form of sweetener, um, and yet there have been a number of reports already which have said that there are issues around that, and um, certainly in the US they've been very concerned about that too. And one of the good things, again, is that the European Food Standards Authority is uh, very assiduous in this particular area and does follow the research. And so once again, it is looking at um, trying to assess the, the, the safe limits or indeed the, the approach to um, the use of aspartame. So um, what I can do again there is that the, the, the consultation they're doing is uh, closing the 15th of February. They're likely to publish an interim review of that and I think once that is done we can bring it back and see exactly what it is they're saying. The next step will be depending upon that outcome action from the um, EFSA which will again uh, make a recommendation. So once we know what their, their view is we'll be in a better position of what will happen next. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Members content to um, send the Brussels Bulletin to relevant committees yes. with specific reference to the Economy Committee on that, that one item? Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item two. We have our witnesses all in place. Um, welcome. Um, I'll just introduce you all. Eh? We've got Dr Dan Tierney, who is a reader in language learning at Strathclyde University and is a, a Hamiltonian, shall I say. Um, eh, we've got Brian Templeton, who is a reader in Pedagogy at the Policy and Practice at University of Glasgow. Welcome. And we've got Professor, Professor Antonella Sorace. I pronounced that properly? Yep. Professor of Developmental Linguistics at the University of Edinburgh. And Dr Judith McClure, who's the convener of the Scotland China Education Network. Um, can I welcome, welcome you all uh, to committee and thank you for the written evidence that you have given us. We are very tight for time this morning, so we're going to go straight into questions. Um, and we are going to kick off with Jamie McGregor. If you're ready, Jamie. Uh, yes, I think I am. Thank you. Um, right. Uh, should all future primary school teachers have a language qualification as recommended by the working group? If so, at what level and how feasible would such a proposal be? I'll maybe start with if that's okay, thank you very much. And good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to being here to, to contribute to this very important development. Um, I think the question goes straight to one of the essential um, issues that we have to deal with in taking forward a national strategy 
in this in this way because I would personally say that if we are hoping to have a national strategy that offers equality of opportunity to, to pupils all around Scotland, we do need to move to a position where um, all primary teachers can contribute to that process and therefore they need to be trained uh, to a certain level. I'm conscious of how difficult it is to do that because at the moment trying to staff primary six and seven is a very demanding challenge and training primary teachers who are very heavily committed in trying to deliver the entire school curriculum and an age range stretching from um, nursery through to P7 is a very demanding task and fitting in a modern language is a very, very difficult, difficult thing to do. Um, personally, I'm not sure that I would say the higher reference, the reference to having a higher qualification is particularly important. Um, I think what we need to do in teacher education is to look specifically at what we want the teachers to be able to do and to give them the skills that will enable them to do that. My own preference would be that through initial teacher education, we train primary teachers so that they can work with their own class. I think one of the weaknesses of the current system is that it relies too much on drop-in teaching, whether that drop-in person is a visiting specialist or a drop-in teacher who's leaving their own class in the primary to teach someone else's class. I don't think that's a good model for learning languages well because you need continuity, you need daily exposure to the language. So I think we have to try and move to a position where every primary teacher can work in the foreign language with their pupils. I think, if, if you don't mind, I, I think that um, there are two areas in initial teacher education that we could equip all teachers to tackle. One is making the links between learning a foreign language and their first language and how the two help each other. So we can use learning a foreign language to give them a second chance at improving literacy in their first. The cultural dimension, cultural awareness as well, is something which all primary teachers could be able to deliver as part of interdisciplinary projects as they currently do. The difficult one is the language competence because we need the primary teachers to be able to model and expose the pupils to the foreign language on a daily basis. And I think that's the difficult one to, to do. But I think we should try and get all primary teachers in the future able to come out with that level of competence in a language and able to do those other two areas. In addition to that, I think I would also say we need CPD programmes, continuing professional development programmes, to take some teachers to a higher level where they can organise, coordinate, give inputs in that foreign language and maybe act as language champions within their school <clears throat> where they have a responsibility for coordinating activities, linking with outside agencies, bringing in um, parents, people who've got an ability in the language and trying to coordinate that. I think it's a, a kind of two-tier approach that we need and it's a very demanding and long-term and I would say fairly expensive um, programme that you would be embarking on there. But I think it's essential if we really want to make a difference there. Sorry that was so long. Fine. Um, can, 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 I, can I carry on there? Um, I'm particularly concerned about uh, um, rural primary schools who don't have so many teachers and how this is going to work there. Uh, but, so that I would like you to comment on that as well. But can I just also ask you, what types of languages and how to learn them. Um, because I, 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 I asked this to the last panel of experts and I didn't really get an answer on it. And are there any specific languages ch children should be learning and what is the reason for them learning those particular languages? Can, can, I, can I take that Dr. and follow on from your previous question? I think you're, you're absolutely you're asking the right question, the absolute right question, and we need to decide what our objectives are. Um, do we want our children to start age five learning Chinese and ten years later to be fluent in Chinese so that they can go and, and work in China or whatever or export to China? Um, or do we want our children to learn French because that's the one that most of our teachers already have and continue with that? Or do we want our children to learn a little bit of different languages and celebrate the diversity of languages we have in our community? 
some Punjabi, some Arabic, and, and so on. It's a question of what their objective actually is. That's, that's the starting point, and that's where I was worried about the report, because I don't think it gives a clear steer, and I think that's why you're asking the question, a clear steer exactly what we actually have. The other problem is the coherence. If we actually look at the research evidence from Scotland, my own research, the research of Dr. Guy Stegi and others, it actually shows some problems in terms of mismatch. And you're absolutely right in terms of rural school, because teachers move, move. <laughs> I'm glad that was you and not me, okay? <laughs> teachers, teachers move, move around, don't they? Um, that's the problem as well. You could have a teacher in, in your constituency who actually has, has actually learned German, for example, and then actually goes for promotion in another school. And if the situation in the other school is that actually the children are learning French, then we've got, a, we've got a mismatch. And so we've got that problem of lack of continuity. And I, I was, I'm was i slightly concerned that that's not been taken account of. That's the present situation we have. And that hasn't really been taken account of. It's, it's a question of what we want to achieve. And, and that's, that's what we really need. That's a starting point. Sorry. Can we just make sure that all electronic devices are off, please, because they do interfere with broadcasting? Mm -hmm. Jamie? I'm trying to get it to go off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Has any other members of the panel got yet? Yeah, yeah, Professor Sorachi, do you want to come in? Could I? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'd like to make uh, two points. First of all, thank you for inviting me to contribute to the work of the committee. I'm very pleased. I think this is a, a real turning point for Scotland if uh, the proposal is implemented. And I'm aware of all the difficulties, but I really think that it's much needed and it could be a real turning point. I would like to make a point following your uh, uh, observations about uh, which languages. Um, I'm speaking from the point of view of a researcher uh, about uh, how language development takes place in children. And uh, I can tell you that any language can be good, potentially. I know that we're talking about planning, you know, which languages can be useful in the future for the country, and those are important considerations. But I can tell you that having more than one language in the same brain is a fantastic advantage for all children. It really opens the mind. It provides children with greater mental flexibility. Uh, and this is independently of which languages we're talking about. So from this point of view, a minority language spoken in only in certain areas, like Gaelic, is as good as a very important and useful language like Chinese. So from this point of view, that's the first point I wanted to make. The second point is that from the point of view of how difficult it might be to learn these languages, if a child is young, no language is more difficult than others. So learning Chinese that is difficult for us as, a, as adult learners wouldn't be difficult because it would be exposure to the spoken language. It wouldn't be difficult for a young child. Um, so uh, so that, that's another uh, uh, worry that uh, sometimes I've heard. And, uh, and it's not really justified in terms of how children learn languages. Young children learn languages implicitly. They don't need to know the grammar. Uh, in fact, they learn better when they are not taught the grammar. So they learn better when they are exposed to the language. Certainly, older learners, as you, I think, said in your, in your uh, written, st written statements, learn more efficiently in the sense that they can benefit from formal learning uh, much better than younger learning. But that's a different kind of learning. And I think that it would be a great shame not take advantage of the uh, uh, real uh, potential for learning languages naturally upon exposure in young children. I think it's very important we make the distinction between learning a language as a natural language in the home and the bilingual situation or in the community and the actual learning a language in the classroom in the primary one situation, primary two, and so on. That's a different situation. When you say about ease of learning, though, it's important, again, I think, to stress that you're talking about them hearing the language and speaking the language. Obviously, once it comes to writing the language and reading the language, we have different difficulties coming in Literally. to play. And it's important to get that distinction between language acquisition, which we have a Polish child comes to Scotland and learns English fairly quickly, okay, but... The difference between that child going to school in Hamilton and, and starting Chinese at age five and carrying on through to 15, that's a different scenario. That's language learning as opposed to language acquisition. Okay, Claire Adamson, have you got a quick supplementary? Yeah? Quick supplementary. It's actually about the, because um, you mentioned about the pedagogy of, of, of teaching um, languages. Um, and just, just to confirm my understanding of it, um, 
Are the skills required to teach a language transferable to other languages? Is it is it possible for those to be for a teacher to be taught how to teach languages and that to to then be able to change from German or French or whatever? I, I would say that the methodology is common, certainly to all modern European languages. We talk about the communicative methodology, which is based on how children learn or acquire their first language because undoubtedly the best way to learn a second language is to replicate the way you learned your first, which, as Antonella is saying, is easy, easy to do because you're in the right environment for it. You're exposed to the language being used meaningfully. You're listening to models that you can then make your own. Now, I think as Dan's saying, we can't replicate that in P1 because you're talking then of um, Gaelic medium type schools, which are hugely expensive, and to try and replicate that through Scotland would be very, very difficult to say the least. Um, but we can learn from the process, and that's what the communicative approach does. We try to replicate that process. That's why there's such an emphasis on listening before speaking and then followed by reading and writing supporting that, so that they're hearing the language, they're hearing the language being modelled by the teacher so that they can then start to use it themselves and then use it more accurately. So that's why the teacher has to have a competence and a confidence in the language to provide that model for the learner. And that's the difficult bit, I think, for primary teachers. But the skills, the approach, the communicative approach is common to all the languages. So that's an element that we could help all primary teachers work with. And if I can also say, in, in link to my earlier point, you know, at the moment in the Curriculum for Excellence framework, we have three key aims for modern languages. One is to look at the interconnected nature of languages. That is to see how learning, the process of learning a new language, um, gives you the skills you need to become a better learner, but also helps you reflect on your first language and, as I say, can improve literacy. There's the cultural awareness, active citizenship, and then there's the communicative competence. And my point is, I think, that with the correct input, we can train all primary teachers certainly to do the first two and then try and give them by looking at daily exposure to the pupils, looking at classroom language, looking at numbers, games, so they're hearing the language on a day-to-day -day basis. And if that can then be top, topped up by more specialist input on a drop-in basis, then I think you have a more sustainable model. But you still have very important decisions to make as to which languages you want the pupils to continue with and to what level you want them to continue with. And as I say, at the moment, obviously I think these are really questions for the implementation phase, but I think it's important here that we raise these questions so that they are looked at in depth at the next phase because they are very difficult ones to, to resolve. Okay, a supplementary from Rod Campbell. It just, uh, it's, it's to Dr Tierney just before we go too far away from what you were saying. If we assume for the moment that the objective is linguistic competence, could you just clarify what your one plus one actually are? Kind of which languages would you think we should be dealing with? Well, well, that's not a decision for me. Um, I appreciate that. To, to be honest, um, if it depends really what, what we want to achieve as a nation, doesn't it? The easiest one would be to go for French. All children learn French because we have a, a teaching workforce. We have a lot of people trained in that. A lot of people have done that as a higher, as the first language. That could happen. And then the second language could be Spanish or German. And that way actually wouldn't have the mismatch in terms of continuity into secondary. We've got significant problems in terms of transition into secondary with the present model. So I'm wondering what kind of problems we would have if they start at P1, people move around and so on. We have problems of transition. It's that difficulty. Other countries have got the simple answer that it's English and you carry it through and there's that continuity. So that's, that's your issue. Um, again, it could be that you go for the first language um, could be Gaelic, for example, if we actually were willing to invest the money in training everyone up in Gaelic and all our children learn Gaelic. And the second language could be an, a, another language, okay, or, or a, a various languages, community languages, Arabic, Punjabi, and so on. We could go down that route. It depends what we're trying to achieve. But what concerns me is when we actually talk about seeing a five-year-old, and I've been in 150 schools in Scotland as part of my research and part of, as National Development Officer. And, of course, it's, it's wonderful to see a five-year-old um, doing a song in Spanish or playing a game in Italian or whatever. But the, it's the continuity. It's building on that. And when we then actually then start talking about um, for business purposes, for getting the job and competing with our competitors, that's a difference. That's going to cost a lot of money to achieve that, if that's what we're trying to achieve. So I, I keep coming back to objectives. 
It's a question of what we're trying to achieve. And the thing that worries me is the evidence at the moment from my own research, which, which I don't think has been taken account of properly, which is the, the lack of continuity in the present situation in the classrooms and in our schools. And we need to solve that. Um, you know, it, it, I think it would be a good idea to, to go to some staff rooms and talk to teachers um, as well and, and hear what they're saying about it. And um, we do have significant problems, and it, it's important to recognise those. Jennifer, could I just continue with this point, if I may? Because when we're looking at what we're trying to achieve, what we're trying to achieve is getting over the fact that we're so hopeless at languages. You know, we, we've got a fear of speaking languages. Now, I speak personally here. My languages are in my head, and I'm terrified of saying something in case I make a mistake. And I think that goes for an awful lot of people. And we mustn't look upon languages as something that you need to be perfect at and pass examinations in. We've got to get confidence in communicating with other people. And I think Brian's absolutely right. We've got the difficulty of the fact that English is a world language. And therefore, we're confronted with a whole range of languages. But that's part of our rich history and cultural heritage. And so the more children are introduced naturally to languages at an early stage, feel you can communicate. You don't, it doesn't matter about making mistakes. In speaking English now, I'm probably making all sorts of mistakes. So what? You're, you're, you're letting me do it because I'm saying something to you. And we've got to get that sort of approach. We've got, as, as uh, Brian said, to give our primary teachers the confidence to feel they can use other native speakers. They've got to lead in the classroom. Languages have got to be a natural part of what happens. Now, I do agree we've got to sustain things. I think it would be terrible to focus on two languages, even though, as you will recognise, I'm partisan about Chinese. I don't think everybody ought to learn it. I think it ought to be accessible and open, and people ought to see that it can be learned. L language learning can go on through life. Communication can go on through life. So we mustn't be hung up with getting it perfect from the start. We need enthusiasm and the capacity to learn, as Antonella has showed in all her work. Could I so add a yeah, point, uh, again, as a, as a cognitive scientist, I can, I can tell you that, yes, the, the issue of continuity, I can see where the problem is, you know, that, that if you really want, you know, a, a child then to grow up as a fluent speaker of a language, you know, the issue of continuity arises. But from the point of view of uh, development, there's plenty of evidence that uh, even exposure to one language actually benefits the others. So I, I don't think we should be, uh, again, over ambitious in the sense that we have to get everything absolutely right in place uh, in order to change. I think even, even discontinuous exposure to languages is beneficial. And it has been proved that a child, you know, even if uh, it has, the, a child who has a little bit of exposure to a language and then is exposed to a different language. Um, uh, the, there is a number of skills that can transfer from exposure to one, langu to one language to the other. Uh, so the language learning in one language benefits the other. So I, I think, uh, I, think we, uh, I agree with, uh, with Judith that we should be, we should be uh, more enthusiastic about, about uh, exposing children to languages as early as we can. At the same time, facing the issue of which language Languages do we want to really invest in and uh, and make sure that uh, that children reach high levels in? But I wouldn't underestimate the uh, the effectiveness and the usefulness of uh, of even discontinuous exposure to multiple languages at an early age. Thank, thanks for that. Just um, very quickly uh, on that point, we've talked a lot about teachers, um, and I think I'm going to bring Hanzala in now because he wants to talk about teaching assistants and other support staff and the skills that they need. Hanzala. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was really very interested with comments that Dr. Dante has made in regards to talking to teachers in class in, um, in their, um, what was the word you used again, in their um, break times uh, and take, speaking to head teachers and so on. One of the questions that I was interested in to find it from the panel, but particularly from uh, Dr. Tierney in regards to uh, do existing teachers and assistants have the skills to do the teaching for us uh, and are they got the enough resources available to them at the moment? Uh, because Glasgow the city has what 150 different languages, but not all cities in Scotland have that option. Uh, we, have a, we have a huge pool in Glasgow that we may be able to tap into, 
but not so in other parts of Scotland. And also if he could or the panel could identify sources where this resource could be gathered if we need it um, so that we can skill our teaching staff. And I absolutely agree in terms of supporting the additional support needs to be there. But how do we actually then uh, dove feather that in to the system that we have currently in our education where we where most of our schools don't actually have additional languages. We already have quite a number of teachers who went through the Modern Language and Primary School training programme. Um, I was National Development Officer for that um, in the previous uh, previous situation, um, and we put through a lot of teachers through a national training programme. I was responsible for the implementation of that, and then following that, I then travelled around the country, Shetland to Sunra, seeing what was happening, speaking to teachers, and so on. I followed that with my own research, um, my own PhD, and looking at it. So based on, on that, I'm aware we have a lot of teachers. Um, but one of the issues that came out of that was the fact that, that teachers move around, um, and pupils move around, and sometimes we have a mismatch. We also had a situation where we thought about embedding it. It would be P6, P7, and that would be the teacher who would actually be trained in the language and then would actually do it with a P6 and P7 class. And we found after a couple of years, the head teachers were telling, telling us, no, no, that's not going to happen. I want her down in P1, I want her in P3. I'm not going to lock her into P6, P7. And we had what Brian described earlier on as a swap-over model. So we had some problems. Um, we also discovered, I also discovered my research in talking to, to teachers that sometimes it would be actually, it would not be carried on in one particular school because the teacher had left or the teacher was on maternity leave um, with that particular language. And therefore you had that problem in terms of continuity to secondary. Um, some children would go to the secondary with um, two years behind them, others would go with a few months, others would go with just a, a language awareness type programme maybe that had been carried out, the kind of thing that Antonella was saying we could, and we could do that, we could obviously go for that. Um, and, and what would actually happen is you'd have the secondary teacher saying, well, it's a fresh start. I've got to start again because they're all at different stages. And, and, and it's important, I think, to speak to the teachers about, about that. Um, we, we could bring in, um, and, and I think we'd welcome it, bring in um, people who have the languages in the community and bring them in, assisting the teachers. I think that's important. I did a study visit to France where, I, where they hadn't actually gone for trained teachers. They had gone for people who, well, I actually witnessed one lady who had actually lived in Jersey for a little while, um, basically, and, um, and, and she was doing the, the teaching. Um, but she didn't actually know how to teach a language. She didn't have the pedagogy, um, and therefore the children were, were more confused in a way, so we could do some harm. But the, class, the assistance, the people in our local community coming in and working alongside the teacher, that would be great as part of what Anthony was describing as the language awareness programme, and I come back to that distinction between linguistic competence and language awareness. Could I add to that and say that we have an enormous resource in our universities, in students who are learning languages, but also in international students. We are attracting international students in very large numbers, which is wonderful for us. Getting them to go into schools as volunteers, low cost, enthusiastic, it's widening access to university because they're talking about their experience in university, it's introducing children to native cultures as well as native languages. The primary teacher leads the partnership and I think that is something that could work, it has worked in quite a number of schools and it could work throughout Scotland if it were properly done. Uh, and we've got to go for these low cost solutions which use the resources we have and we mustn't forget that we have the British Council's connecting classroom schemes, that schools can, with the internet, connect with the schools all over the world and talk in other languages. There are many resources around, but I do think that the partnership with universities is a key one. Can I just say also, I think, I mean, there are lots of resources, as Judith said, there, both for teaching and for learning. Um, we've also got cultural organisations who provide an immense amount of help to primary and to secondary teachers for taking forward the languages. There are lots of potential for using native speakers who are with us and so on. But I think in addition to that, we still need to look at the primary teacher's competence mm -hmm. to coordinate that and to make it work for the age stage they're working with. And I do think we need to be clearer about the objectives because the objectives in P1, if we're aiming for a P1 start, won't be the same as in P6, 7. Because in P1, 2, 3, we will be looking at experiential learning, structured play, exposure to the language, enjoyment, etc. And we may not be too worried about the continuity in that language, but at some point we are going to have to narrow that choice and say if we want them to achieve 
a recognised qualification and level of competence so that they can compete with European competitors, we at some point have to make choices as to which language we want progression, continuity and qualifications in. And at that point, we have to look, I think, at what's currently happening in the P6 to S3 and, and beyond area of Curriculum for Excellence and see what are the issues there that we need to address, because there are quite a few serious ones there about continuity and how that, that people can get to a certain level. And, you know, most of the European countries with their programme, they tend to have clear targets for them to work towards, or at least measures of attainment, often linked to the common European framework of reference, so that they have a kind of international equivalence as to what they're looking for. So, for example, they would be looking by the end of their school career to have achieved um, independent user level in the first language that started and possibly basic user level in another language. You know, and I think once we move away from the focus on the early stages there and look at those parts, we do have to think about progression, continuity and sustainability in the number of languages we can take to that sort of level. You just so, on that, that point, sorry. I just wanted to come back, if, if I may. It's just that uh, some very valuable points have come out. Just that, that session alone, in terms of using community students and uh, focusing, and more importantly of all, is the standard that we are hoping to reach. I think that that's the that's the real crux of the matter. Despite using all the various facilities available to us, I think that's got to be the most important one: is do we actually reach those standards, or, or do we reach the benchmarks that we create for ourselves? So first of all, I think we need to really get to grips with what is the benchmark uh, at primary level and secondary level. And the other, of course, the introduction of universities and university students is an exceptionally good one as well because it then focuses our young to think about going to university rather than any other career to start off with. And I think that that in itself is very valuable. But I think coming back to the, the point, uh, Dr. Taney, you made in terms of your experiences across Scotland, clearly uh, there are areas, there are gaps that we will be expected to fill. And, and I'm just wondering whether there is a scope where we could carry out to try and find how we bridge that gap. Uh, and perhaps you would either have the, the opportunity today to share your, some views with us today, or if not, perhaps uh, later on, you could perhaps give us an idea of how you feel that we could bridge that gap, because this certainly, clearly, it's a gap that needs to be filled. Yeah, um, I, there, is, there is a gap, and I, 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 I want this to succeed. Um, but it's quite an ambitious target that's been set to think we'll start in P1 and we'll carry right through with the same language when we start talking about competing with our, uh, competing with our European competitors. Um, and that's what concerns me a little bit in terms of you know, the, the problems we already have identified in, in terms of the gap. Um, if we need to decide what our objectives are, again, it comes back to that. Um, if we could train all our teachers in, in, in a little bit of different languages and have a language awareness, the kind of thing that Antonella and I think Judith are, are talking about, then that's, that's fine, as long as we realise that's what we are trying to do. Um, therefore, the continuity to secondary doesn't matter so much. But if we're talking about, and when we start talking about competing with, you know, and, and exporting to Germany, and there are references to, to those kind of things happening, we've got to be realistic that that would need everybody to do the same language and have that continuity. Now, we could do it in a local cluster, but the problem even in local cluster is, is that we have a mismatch already. We have a mismatch. We have, we have people. Um, in, for example, in, in, in the Giffnock area, teachers were trained in Italian um, to, to teach it in the primary school. And then the secondary school decided to stop teaching Italian. So the teachers then had to be retrained in French. It's important to recognise that there will be these kind of difficulties. You're, you're, absolutely. Uh, you're shaking your head, but it's true. Um, and there were a number of issues like that. So it's important to recognise that it's a complex issue. Um, it's a really complex issue, and, and this, uh, we have to decide exactly what we're trying to do, and we have to have a coherent programme. And I'm not sure, to be honest, that the teaching force and, uh, is ready and that we're ready to go to P1. Uh, I've, got, I've got grave concerns about that, based on where we're at at the moment. Yeah. I, 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 it's, it's very laudable, but I'm not sure we're there. Yeah. I hate to say it, but I'd like to see it starting at the age of three. Mm -hmm. I think three is a great time for see, hearing see, other languages, taking part, language, singing, though. hearing yeah. other languages. Yeah. The, the earlier the better, mm -hmm. really. By the time you get to 11 or 12, fear has set in. Attitudes. Attitudes have set in. Yeah. 
Well, I think we're, we're visiting a school tomorrow, uh, uh, my colleague Claire and I, uh, where I think they, they do uh, do a taster in languages from nursery level right through. It's in, it's in Edelwood, it's known Hill House. Sorry, Dr Tierney. <laughs> um, but just on... Just on the point of expanding out, and, and both Brian Templeton and Dr Tierney had mentioned the European dimension, and on that, I think Claire Adamson is going to come in about the compare and contrast. So, Claire. Yes, it, it was. Really, I mean, you have touched on the, on the issue of, of, of the, the economic um, reasons for the roles of the languages, and, and the, the Scottish Government paper actually estimates that the loss to the economy um, through lack of language is, is 500 million. Um, so, so it's really to, to see, um, obviously we don't have the, the choice of English as being the, the language of choice as, as, a, as an initial one, but, but how does the, the, the one plus two model being proposed compare to what's happening in the rest of Europe? Most of Europe has obviously gone down the one plus two, two route mm -hmm. in the sense of the, that they've actually started English. Um, if you if you take Spain, which I know best of all, the, the children start English and then pick up another language, be it Basque or Catalan or or, or French or German, perhaps uh, at a later stage, with an awareness of that language. But the continuity issue is English, and their teachers are trained in English at university, and therefore they have a high level of English competence. You see what I mean? So it's easier in that sense for them. Okay, so, they, so that's where most countries have gone. Um, I worry about the economic argument because if we can, we then say, oh, well, we'll do that as well, and then you then have to come back to, to what um, Jim McGregor said, which language do we do it? We, you know, if that's what we want, if we want our 15-year-olds to come out fluent in French, fine, it can be done. It will cost a bit of money to get us there, it can be done. But that's, that, there's your, your problem. It's the same old problem in terms of, you know, uh, you know, so it's important uh, you know, to be aware of that difference between linguistic competence in terms of economic reasons for doing it or language awareness, cultural awareness, okay? which like, is, is totally possible as well and could be done um, and wouldn't, it would, wouldn't uh, present the same problem in terms of continuity into secondary. But, um, but, so we're in, a, we're in a different situation. It's important that we identify our own objectives. Yes, we are in a different situation, and uh, and it's certainly true. But that's not an argument for delaying or you know not not you know being. Uh, there are the decisions to be made, um, and uh, we yes we are partly different from other European countries. I have here a British Council report on early language learning in Europe called Ellie. It can be downloaded from the web. And it's the result of a longitudinal study on seven European countries where languages are introduced in primary school. Um, it's a very complete report. It really shows that language learning works. England was one of the uh, uh, places that they, uh, they looked at. And, uh, and England actually fares relatively worse <laughs> than, the, than, the other, than the other countries. But it's a very complete report that shows how important all the issues that we mentioned are. So training teachers, making them aware of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, making them aware of uh, how languages are learned. Um, uh, making sure that they have the required level, levels of competence and so on. But at the same time, it shows that in other countries, yes, it works. It works in introducing languages early on. It works and pays off. I think the comparative element is very important. Um, if I may uh, say so, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm organizing an event here at the Scottish Parliament where representatives from four European countries will talk about the language learning situation. And that's on the 4th of February, Monday the 4th of February from uh, 6 to 8. So we'll have, uh, the context will be the one plus two proposal. In fact, uh, Simon McCauley will come and present, uh, summarize the proposal. But then there will be uh, speakers from, uh, from other countries um, who will uh, present evidence from. So this is a, a very good uh, opportunity to compare, uh, to compare experience. It seems to me that uh, the point is that, yes, in this country, English is the world language, and so uh, decisions have to be made about which other languages and so on, but we should act quickly because it is true that, uh, that this country is, is really facing a, a huge loss, also in econo economic terms. Um, I'm speaking at the Financial Times on the 15th of February. I've been invited to speak about the uh, disadvantage 
vestiges of monolingualism for Britain. So the, the business world, the, the private sector, is acutely aware of the problem. So something really must be done. I think as well, we really have to take into account the fact that not everyone needs to get higher level in languages. There are many different levels in languages available from the SQA. And quite frankly, Access 3, National 3, at least means you can communicate in a language. Now, just think of people in hospitality, in our shops. You know, if they're able to communicate with visitors from abroad, with people who are domiciled here, with our own community in other languages, that is not happening at the moment, is it, as we all know? We're not, we're not actually communicating even at the most basic level in many areas of our economy. So I think we ought to encourage all pupils to make a choice of languages in their secondary education and to keep them going. I hope in the longer term that, that future teachers will have higher, uh, higher language and should be encouraged to do so. More and more people should be encouraged to do so. But languages at all levels matter. People have got to be confident to have a go. Jimmy McGregor. Just on that point, then, um, we heard from uh, Dr. Sarazzi that, that um, all languages, she considers all languages to be important, and I, I would agree with her. She mentioned Gaelic, for example. But on that point, um, and, and Dr. McClure, you, you made this point that you want them, the children to make a choice. Um, which is, the, which, is there any evidence of which is the easiest language to learn? I don't think that's a question at all. I think if you started at three to be introduced to other languages, I don't think that one is easier than another, as Professor Saracci has said. Vocabulary. I beg your pardon? Is there, a, 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 is there a big difference between vocabularies of different languages no. in terms no. of numbers of words? No. I don't think that's the case. There's no difficult, well, you know, it, computationally, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you calculate the number of words, but from the point of view of a child who learns a language, a young child, uh, there's no difference between learning Chinese and learning Gaelic or learning French. Uh, that is really, for a young child, I'm not talking about the written language, obviously, I'm not talking about literacy, I'm talking about exposure, natural exposure to the spoken language. All languages are equal for a child's brain. Can I just ask one short supplementary on that? Okay, I accept that. For, for somebody who has already learnt English, is, what is the easiest language to learn? <laughs> doesn't give up. It's good. Again, this difference is, you're right, I mean, it's an interesting point, but the point becomes more relevant if, with age, okay? So it's very relevant for an adult language learner. So I work on adult language learning as well, and yes, that question is very, very important because learning, you know, for an English native speaker, um, uh, certain languages are much easier than others, okay? Wow. <laughs> uh, well, uh, languages belonging to the same typological family, you know, that share cognates and vocabulary. She doesn't say Italian, but um, probably Italian. <laughs> Italian is a friendly language. Everybody knows that. So, uh, but for a child, these differences, you know, which language you start from, you know, for a three-year-old, it really is, it's much less of a problem than later on. And that is a very good reason for sensitizing children as, er as early as possible to the existence of other languages, to the sounds of other languages, to the fact that words are different in other languages. Think of the advantage of a child who knows that, you know, this is a pencil in English but a matita in Italian, and so they know that other people have different points of view, that the object is not naturally called a pencil because in another language it's called in a different way. That opens the mind. That really makes children more sensitive, more understanding toward, uh, towards other, other people's points of view, other people's perspectives. So there are advantages outside language that we really, really have to take uh, into account. Kate Rod Campbell? Yeah, just kind of following on, I detect from, obviously, from you, Professor uh, Sirachi, and from Dr. McClure, an enthusiasm for starting young and, and starting informally. Are there benefits and problems from, from then making a transition from an informal approach to learning to, to a more formal approach? Or? Any comments on that? Right. Yes. Um, obviously, having a background in the spoken language will, will help a lot when it comes to acquiring literacy in that language. If you think of the way native children acquire literacy, they start reading when they have a lot of spoken competence already. 
Okay, many, whereas many foreign language learners start speaking, you know, and reading at the same time. So they don't have that benefit of having reading based on the spoken competence. So I would say that exposure to the spoken language is definitely an advantage. But I would also add that individual differences start playing an important role again later on. They're much more visible later on. And they're much more visible with respect to formal learning. So learning the, the you know, the language in the formal way. So learning the grammar, you know, through a structured approach approach, that's where you see individual differences that have to do with, uh, well, with individual cognitive profiles, for example, uh, individual histories, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, and so on. For younger children, these differences are a lot less visible. Um, so that is another factor that, to me, uh, is, is a very strong factor for, for uh, exposing children to languages as early as possible. Can, can I just add to that, that I think we have the assumption that when you get to secondary school, suddenly languages are four periods a week and that's all you do them. You see, I think we should be thinking of languages as something like Curriculum for Excellence that goes across the curriculum, that you hear languages spoken, that if you're looking at geography, you will be doing something, connecting with another school abroad. You'll be listening to language all the time. There will be assemblies in different languages, foreign visitors coming into the school who will talk in different languages. So language is a part of what we offer. Okay, um, moving on, Willie Coffee. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning. Uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to, to broaden this, the discussion a little bit, and if I could possibly grab two questions, depending on the time we have. Convener, the first is, how do we encourage our families in, in Scotland, the parents of young Scottish children, to assist here? My, my guess would be that um, parents of children within the European countries do have an extra language, do have another language, and perhaps parents of Scottish children in Scotland don't have a second language. How can we assist parents at home to participate in this exciting programme of bringing in languages to their primary schools? Sorry, I don't want to. Can I say something about this? I, uh, I now have uh, uh, extensive experience of communicating with families, not just in Scotland, but uh, elsewhere. And, uh, and I think your point is extremely important because having families on board, so having families supporting children in language learning is absolutely necessary. But in order to do that, I think families should have the right information about how languages are learned. Uh, and it, I can tell you my experience as, a, as somebody who's engaged uh, in, uh, in uh, dissemination of information. I, I do this all the time. Uh, uh, I have a public engagement service that allows me to talk to families at all levels, uh, from recently arrived immigrants to very highly educated uh, and, and wealthy families. Uh, there is an issue of often misunderstanding and uh, wrong expectations and prejudice this is against early bilingualism. Um, so it's important uh, that, uh, that we provide people with the right information. And it is possible, because I've been doing this, and I'm very optimistic about that. If the right information is provided at the right level, then parents become very supportive, very enthousi enthusiastic, and they can support their children. Children don't have negative attitudes to start with. They absorb negative attitudes from their families and from the world around them. Uh, so we have to act on the, on the environment as well. We have to act on families, we have to act on schools, we have to act on making sure that people make informed decisions based on correct information about how languages are learned. And we, as academics, I think, have a special responsibility in that. And I would like to relate back to your point about the involvement of universities in this, uh, in this enterprise. I think universities have a, a huge uh, impact. Uh, they can have a huge impact also from this point of view, bridging the gap about between what is coming out from research Research and what people actually think. Uh, and there's a lot of very good work to be done, and uh, uh, in, on the basis of my experience, it is very effective. And can I just add to that? 
that languages are a wonderful way of engaging parents in the life of the school. Think of performances in other languages. <coughs> parents love to come to take part in that and see it. And if, as Antonella says, they have the right information, they can engage themselves at home, particularly if the school is making efforts to give them the opportunities to do that and communicating what it's doing. Okay, very much. I, 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 I have no problem with, with what's been described in terms of you know, um, the, the children... Um, having an awareness of different languages and, 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 and you know, having a taste of different languages. But again, I keep coming back to the important point is, to what, is what is our objective here? What are we spending the money to achieve? Is it that they just have, a, a, you know, they have a, a, something to do with the festival in China or a festival here or a festival there? Is it that kind of language awareness? And the other thing I'll come back to, just in the parental one, if I can pick that up, um, about 20 odd years ago, I was on Radio Scotland in the morning and talking about to Colin Bell about national motivation for learning languages. And just recently, I was again on Radio Scotland and again, what was I talking about? <laughs> national motivation. Because we have the problem in terms of that we don't actually have the, 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 the requirement to learn a language simply because of the dominance of English. So we've got to get over that. And that's a big issue that we really need to convince parents that languages are important. Um, so I'm, I'm totally agreeing with that. Could I, is that time to ask a second question? Yeah. It was really to ask about what, what, what your opinions are about engagement with language, but with science students. I know we're looking. I'm looking forward towards later uh, secondary for kids that may want to take science and engineering, perhaps as a as a career, and the importance of combining that with a language. In my experience, from my past. I chose a science route and excluded the language from that because I didn't think it was necessary. But I think from the, the evidence that we've had today that there's an increasing importance, particularly for science and engineering graduates, to have a, a, a modern language uh, as part of their curriculum. Do you, do you think there's sufficient flexibility in our present arrangements within the curriculum to enable that to, 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 to happen so that science and engineering students who wish to pursue that can also have a foreign language? If I wasn't sitting here, I would start to cheer at this point because I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's vital that people keep languages going. I think it's so important. And we must remember, if you're doing science and engineering, you may not want to study the literature of another language. You may just want to be able to communicate in that language and read in that language, and we must take account of that. And now there are degrees, say, at Harriet Watt University, in interpreting. It's not about literature. It's about interpreting. And we need that sort of approach in schools too, and I think we've just got to make it happen. We've got to see the importance of it. We've got to convey this message that to succeed in the world in the 21st century, Scotland has got to enable its young people to be able to communicate and to learn languages later in life, not just at the, when they're at school, but to feel that they're able to do it. And certainly science and engineering is vital that, that pupils are going in that direction have some communication skills in other languages. Again, I would absolutely agree with that. But um, again, I think at the moment um, there are there are problems in the secondary area linked to staffing decisions, linked to timetabling decisions that make it sometimes quite difficult for students to get the combinations they want. And it's partly to do with curriculum for excellence moving in and schools looking at timetabling and how many subjects they can offer. Um, so I think, you know, again, there are areas there which could become a blockage to a lot of these very desirable things happening. And my feeling is that we need to look at those areas quite carefully, um, as well as looking at the primary one start. And I feel at the moment there's a slight danger that if we don't look at some of the issues that need to be addressed further up by looking at the P1 start, um, we're, we're storing up problems for later on. I mean, I think there are issues there we need to resolve um, and that's not to preclude an earlier start and exposure to the language, but if as part of this language strategy there is to be some emphasis on progression, continu continuity, sustainability and qualifications, we need to look at some of the blockages that will prevent that or are causing difficulties with that at the moment. Okay. That's just, just one point I wanted to make, and that was about interpreting. I mean, Glasgow universities also provide that service, so we're we're very rich with that. We've got some good uh, facilities in Scotland. It's just a matter of taking them up. Can, can I just 
Can I pick up on the science point in terms of I, I absolutely agree. You know, I, I, I want to see us be doing better in terms of language. I want the students in my university or engineers to actually have a language and to go abroad and actually have that language. We need, well, that's certainly an aim. But it's important how we get there. And what I don't want to happen is the child to start in P1 with one language and then have a gap in P2 and a bit of discontinuity and then get to P6, P6, P7, go into secondary choose a language or whatever, follow a language and then find that the teacher is going over the same ground again, that we have a lack of coherence, we have a lack of sustainability. It's important that we get this right, and, and Brian's absolutely right, that we've got problems at the upper stage of primary, and I think we need to get those fixed um, before we start getting going down to P1. I think on, on the issue of, of continuity, I think uh, Helen is going to come in on that point and expand that a wee bit more. Oh. I mean, I, yes, but before I did that, I was going to ask another question because I've been fascinated and intrigued by everything I've heard this morning and enthused as well. I drive across Europe every year and I go through all the countries all the way down to Bulgaria. And uh, I, so, so I'm very interested in And only last night I sat and chaired a meeting in this room. It was a cross-party group on the Industrial Communities Alliance, and that's about unemployed, unemployment in our communities across Scotland. And we were speaking with the Skills Minister, Andrea, Angela uh, Torrance, and, and we, we were actually talking about the fact that we've got something like 90,000 young people unemployed at the moment in Scotland, 16 to 24 year olds, which is a, just a dreadful situation. And, and, and that's you know, we've had that for decades, it's not just this government. Um, and the, the reality is that there are jobs in places like Germany and others where there's still, although there's some contraction there, there are jobs. We heard only this week on the radio that there were Spanish people going there by the dozen and getting programmes for uh, language training when they got there six hours every day so that they could have these jobs in construction. So whilst there's opportunities for us as a country, there's opportunities for the young people of this country to be able to go anywhere in the world. I mean, we all meet as MSPs with people in all walks of life and we hear about the business opportunities that are there. <coughs> so I'd be interested to know, first of all, how many, or rather, there are 29 countries, I believe, across the EU in membership of the EU. Um, has there been an audit of the universities in Scotland? to ensure that we're teaching a language for each one of those countries in universities in Scotland? My guess is absolutely no. I think our universities need to work together more coherently over these sorts of major issues that affect the whole country. Is that something that could be done relatively easily, an, an audit to see which languages are being taught across Scotland's universities? Well, sure, the audit should be reasonably yeah. easy to do. I think, I think uh, yes. right. dealing with okay, the results well, of it might be more difficult. I'll go back to the question I should really have asked you now, and yeah, that's to I, get you to expand yeah. on the issue about, um, you know, we've talked throughout this morning about the issue of uh, continuity from primary school and throughout primary school and then into secondary school. Um, is there anything further that you would like to say about how we can improve the capacity uh, to, you know, to ensure that the curriculum accommodates this uh, greater language teaching. I think there has to be a very close liaison between the primary and secondary. You know, in, in the pilot model, when modern languages in the primary first started, we had a kind of cluster arrangement where the secondary worked closely with the feeder primaries and they delivered most of the training on a drop-in basis. As I've said earlier, I mean, I don't really favour the drop-in method. I think we have to have the teacher who works with the class every day, eventually able to do it. But I do think there has to be a really close liaison between the primary and secondary. And I do think also we need to look at it from the primary teacher's perspective, because the primary teachers, as I say, are under a lot of pressure, dealing with all the demands of curriculum for excellence across the area. And for them, or for a lot of them, modern languages is a relatively small part of their remit at the moment. So we need to find a way of supporting them both in terms of training outside, but having someone in their school who is trained to a higher level, who, as I mentioned earlier, you could call a languages champion, who actually took a lead role in coordinating the work, organising parents' evenings, organising links with schools abroad, so that there's someone there who's driving it forward. Uh, reading the report of your last uh, meeting and the school that you'd visited, they talked about an inspirational head teacher. And there was a difference that a really good quality teacher in that could make. And at the end of the day, that's the best and most important resource in teaching. It's the quality of interaction between the teacher and pupil, and particularly in modern languages, where you are modelling the language for them. 
So it's really important that we take those people with us and that we look at it from their perspective. Very quickly on that point, because it's one of the ones that we're sort of missing in the, what we've talked about this morning, is the question about that head teacher who was very inspirational and very motivated and was a bit of a, you know, a positive eye on amongst her staff group. Do, do our head teachers need more support to take on that leadership role or is it sort of a natural ability that's there that we need to harness? I think they need to be empowered. I think they're often actually feeling that they're controlled too much. And that the, the, the inspiration that the head teacher that you described so well showed would come out and much more if head teachers were given the opportunity to do things themselves, to link with each other, and to find their own natural partners in all of this. We need experiment and innovation and excitement in it. And interestingly, I think you noticed the head teacher in that school you visited, when asked what she wanted in terms of resource, said, a wee bit of money. You know, we're not talking actually about vast sums if we start looking at the resources we have. What we're trying to achieve whether we're talking about vast sums or not. We could be talking about vast sums, and that's important to recognise that. Hey, Helen? Very much. There's three parts to my last question, and this is uh, the first part of it. Um, should this transition, <coughs> excuse me, my voice is uh, croaky, um, be managed by a, a local authority or a national strategy? That's the first part of it. Second uh, question I have for you is you've talked this morning about schools linking up through computers with schools abroad. Are there really good examples that we could look at that you could tell us about? And uh, thirdly, I, I'm a huge enthusiast of um, it Italy and Sicily because my best friend is Sicilian, a famous novelist. I'll speak to you afterwards about her. Um, she's, uh, you, you, the, I was especially uh, interested to read in our briefing papers this morning, and I just wondered if you wanted to expand a little bit on this, and that's about the project uh, that you, Professor Stracci, um, <clears throat> has undertaken about Let's Become a Bilingual Family Project. Um, which saw Scottish children aged three to seven exposed to a new European language uh, together with their parents over a 12 month period. So there's three for you. Thank you. Yes, can I, can I just answer this question? Um, yes, uh, the project uh, is just completed and uh, we, uh, we were one of five partners and each country had to recruit uh, 25 monolingual families where the children were exposed to another language uh, together with the parents. So they were provided with plenty of materials in a method that has been validated and widely tested all over Europe and that provides uh, engaging materials for children where children hear the same story in different formats, in different modalities. So there's songs and books and videos and acting out and puppets and uh, all kinds of, uh, of ways of getting input. Um, and uh, the families were followed for about a year, uh, and, uh, and we tested them before, uh, beforehand and afterwards. And the project was overall uh, successful. Uh, in Scotland, uh, I, I actually uh, was interviewed on the radio about this, uh, and I, <laughs> the question I was asked was, um, uh, is it true that Scot Scots are bad language learners? Um, I don't think that this is true at all. I think that we had the highest number of, uh, of uh, families who left the project in the middle compared to other European countries. But it's not because they are bad language learners, because they don't have the same motivation for their children to learn languages. And this is what I was saying before. We have to get parents on board. We have to get, give them the correct information. Uh, so I think that this is, a, Scottish people are as good as anybody else at learning languages, but they often don't know. They have a problem in confidence, uh, partly because of the status of English. And so we have to encourage them when they're very young, to the fact that languages are there. There's many languages. They're all different. They're fun to learn. Uh, yes, it's awareness, as you were saying, but not just awareness. I think that benefits actual language learning, actual uh, acquisition of competence, not just uh, you know, knowing that languages are there, uh, but, but, but real, real language competence uh, in, in the longer run. So the project was very useful to, uh, to uh, make us aware of, uh, of the differences in attitudes uh, in different countries. And I think you know, one of the, the families who actually did the project did very well, and they're very happy, and they would like to continue. Um, unfortunately, we can't at the moment. 
Anthony, Anthony, Anthony has dealt with your th third question. If I deal with your first one, mm -hmm. which was in terms of national strategy or local strategy, mm -hmm. and I think you're, you're asking a, a very crucial question again, the, the other crucial question being which language and so on. If we take North and South Lanarkshire, for example, to take the, the, where the chairman knows well, I'm a Hamilton man, mother was not that far away. Okay, let's imagine that North Lanarkshire goes for one particular policy and says we'll learn Chinese and then at P5 we'll, we'll start French or whatever, but South Lanarkshire goes for a different policy. Um, you can see already some of the problems we have in terms of mismatch of languages, and that in the report, I don't think they've addressed that. And yet that's already, there's evidence of that problem in terms of it being done at a local level. How, we either can go for a national strategy and, 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 and do it together, um, you know, and, or else we can leave it to a local strategy, but we're going to have the problem of mismatch. And, and Antonel was saying, that, you know, if, if you learn at an earlier stage, then that's great, you'll be enthusiastic later. But not if you're going over the same ground. Not if you're in S1 and you're going over the ground you've already covered with your, your primary teacher. Um, and that's another, another issue we've got to address. Okay, we've, we're really, really... Missed an answer? Quick, was the answer Sorry. about... Sorry, I'll... Very quickly, the, the middle question was about the links, linking schools with schools abroad, which I think is an excellent idea. I was heavily involved in the Curriculum for Excellence Development in Modern Languages, and part of that was identifying good practice. And if there's one thing I would say we should do for every school in Scotland, primary and secondary, it's get them involved in e-twinning, making a direct link with another school or schools abroad because it immediately gives a context, a relevance for the learning, it brings it alive, it allows the whole community to get involved, it brings in parents. There's an excellent example in uh, Mr Edward Scott's school in the Western Isles uh, where because of the, the link with a Breton school through the Breton, the Celtic connection, if you like, through the Breton and the Gaelic. And it started with the Modern Languages Department. The whole school became involved. Then the whole community became involved as the, the group from Britain they came across. And it was an excellent example, you know, of, of putting all the Curriculum for Excellence principles into practice, you know, relevance, enjoyment, challenge, and so on. So it's, it's certainly a great idea. And I think, in fact, the whole area of ICT is one we need to explore fully in motivating our learners. And, and bringing the languages alive for Okay, thanks for that. We're down to the, the last three minutes. Rod Campbell, if you've got a very, very quick supplementary. It's a, it's a very quick, um, really supplemental for Dr McClure. Just on this issue of transition between primary and secondary, in your written submission, you talk, talked about imaginative local partnerships not necessarily organised by local authorities. Could you just briefly expand on that? I think schools ought to be in partnership with each other, find out what languages they're doing, try to arrange their timetable so that it's possible for them to go. There are all kinds of things that are happening, sometimes led by students. I mean, there are students who want to learn Chinese who, who are finding ways of doing it and going off to the Confucius Institute to learn Chinese. And I think if we just let people go and don't feel it has to be a lockstep approach all the way through. Um, I mean, if we, we can't afford not to do this. In China in 2001, they decided that all primary schools should, should teach English. At the time, they were 5%. Four years later, they were 64%. Now, we can't do that. We, we, we can have strategic direction, but we can't have that level of control. What we need is the strategic direction, which I think this report gives us, and then the local possibilities for enthusiastic head teachers to find partners in the way they bring things about. We're not talking about myriads of languages when it comes down to it. Okay, very, very quickly, last point is, is one of EU funds and whether we access and use them appropriately. And um, I met with the NUS yesterday and they're running this programme of um, languages ambassadors in their international department um, using Erasmus and encouraging young people to, to to um, use Erasmus to study abroad. So um, maybe just a few points on f funding, EU funding, and whether we're doing that properly, and what your thoughts are on the use of Erasmus. I think uh, uh, from what I know of the area, it's, it's not an area of expertise for me, but I, I'm very conscious that in our own university, it, it's, again, it tends to be um, very much a one-way traffic at the moment. We're getting lots of European students coming to us, but finding very difficult to get students when they actually think it through to go. And it comes back to the language competence or confidence in the language, unless it's an area where they're going to get people operating mainly in English or there'll be a strong English element, they're very reluctant to go. Um, and I don't think, therefore, we are accessing the funding that, that should be available. But we need to look at how we support at our students, I think, to make that step forward. 
We have an ongoing inquiry on EU funding, so that sort of ties into to, to what we are doing there. Um, is there any uh, very, very quick last final points? Um, because we need to be finished in a matter of seconds. <laughs> Can I, can I just uh, appeal to you to speak to the teachers, to go, you know, not just the two um, maybe star schools you, you're going to see, but, but, but go, you know, why not go down and have a cup of tea with the teachers and, you know, at a lunch break or something and see what, how they're feeling about it? Because I think it's very, very important that we carry the teaching force with us in this one, and they're aware of the complexity of it and the, the pressures they're under in terms of the curriculum and so on. It's, ideally, we want to get this to happen, but I'm just wondering if, if they're ready for it to go to P1. OK, that's, that's really good advice, and I think we may, may take that. Thank you very much. Can I thank you all for attending the committee today? I think you have, um, we have uh, looked at a lot of arguments you've given us, a lot of light. Um, and if there's anything that you think you've gone away and you think I should have said this, we would be very happy to, to, to hear from you again um, in written form. If you could do that, that would inform our deliberations for our report. But thank you very much, and um, I think that closes this meeting. Um, and our next meeting is the 7th of February. I'll see you all then. Thanks very much. Thank you.